In Australia, dead men cannot sue. Anyone can say anything about the deceased without fear of litigation from other family members. This fundamental flaw in Australian law is the basis of countless smears, fabrications and lies against the father of Chappelle Corby, a woman suffering untold misery in an Indonesian prison. It is also the basis of media reporting which has slowly but surely shaped the opinions of the Australian public. It is the basis for reporting which has replaced proven fact with fiction, fiction which has systematically undermined the prospects of a citizen desperately fighting for her life. This film documents the activities of an Australian reporter, Eamon Duff. In December 2005, the police leaked a bogus story that photographs had been found which implicated Chappelle Corby in criminal drug activities prior to her arrest. The reality was that a petty criminal was one of many Australian tourists who had their picture taken with Chappelle while she was actually on remand in the Bali prison. The setting of some of the photographs was also obvious, but regardless, the story was run with shocking support comments from the AFP. If any evidence existed about Chappelle Corby, there was always a risk that it would come to light eventually. These photos do not appear to have been taken in a prison setting. The truth, however, eventually emerged. But the AFP had already helped to associate Chappelle with drugs in the public mind. Yet again, they had helped to turn public opinion against her. Last year, South Australian police seized the photos from Macaulay's house and handed them to the federal police. The 60-year-old says he only met Chappelle Corby whilst on holiday, after he and a friend attended her trial and struck up a conversation with Corby's mother. She came out and she said, oh, you're here to support Chappelle. Naturally, we're Aussies. They're the two people that we met offered to buy me a drink and they just seemed two nice blokes and we just sat and had a chat. McCauley says the pair later went with Ms Rose to Kerikaban Prison to meet Corby and to pose for the photographs. He says ever since news of the pictures went public he's been accused of prejudicing her appeal, which has made him physically sick. An angry Rosalie Rose travelled to Adelaide last month demanding police release the pictures. She's still furious at those who suggest Macaulay and Corby knew each other before their Bali meeting. I had never known myself to cry so much. I was just so cranky that people just bluntly, just straight out, lie like that. Both Macaulay and Ms Rose say the police knew where the photos were taken and should have revealed that publicly. The leak was also made during Chappelle Corby's appeal process and is considered to be a major contributory factor to her sentence being reinstated at 20 years. Chappelle Corby found out that she was back to facing 20 years in Krobokan jail last night, but her lawyer visiting the prison today said she was still shattered by the rejection of her final appeal. Both men blamed the Australian government and Federal Police Chief Mick Kelty for the appeal loss, saying that the emergence of photos showing Chappelle Corby with another accused drug trafficker had influenced the judges. No action was ever taken against any police officer as a result of this extremely damaging leak of false information. Eamon Duff's first recorded contribution was to join the chorus, reproducing this false story. Note, we can find nothing to suggest that Eamon Duff made any effort to clarify his report. We can find no retraction, no correction, certainly nothing to indicate that any steps at all were taken to undo the damage his syndicated report caused to Chappelle Corby or to her family.
He set the scene for his future output by proudly presenting the results of previous media reporting. Macaulay was subsequently sentenced to three years for another drug conviction, of which he served 15 months. This is considered to be a relatively light outcome for his circumstances. During his 15 months in prison for his latest offence, Macaulay had plenty of time to consider how he could make the most of his situation from a financial perspective. He would have learned quickly about the nature of some in the media from his experiences with the Karabakan photographs and the misinformation generated by the police. He would also have known which journalists ruthlessly ran the false story and which would be likely to run with any false allegations he had up his sleeve. The nature of Macaulay was also confirmed through David McHugh. Mr. McHugh stated directly and in writing that he introduced Macaulay to Chappelle Corby and her family as a tourist in the Bali court. I'm writing in concern with Chappelle Corby. Six months ago, a man in Adelaide, South Australia, was arrested about drugs. While searching his house, police found photos of myself, Chappelle Corby, her mother and Malcolm the man concerned with police. The photos were taken in Bali with my camera. Police straight away linked him with Chappelle only because of the photos, not investigating the photos first. The charges of drugs which Malcolm was charged with have now been discharged in Adelaide, South Australia. I met Malcolm in October 2004 on the plane coming from Australia to Bali. I did not know him before that trip and he did not know Chappelle Corby. I got to know the family through going to the court hearing. Malcolm one time came to the court hearings with me which I introduced Malcolm to the family. That's the only contact Malcolm had with the Corby family through myself. This, of course, wholly aligned with Macaulay's own words at the time and that of every other party. Eamon Duff, however, was hard at work. His exclusive, which followed this, was even more damaging. It directly contradicted every other account, including Macaulay's previous words, and presented no sustainable evidence whatsoever. Note that the headline, She knew her father was a drug dealer, was not the original. The original was, I sold Chappelle Corby the drugs, which took Macaulay's implausible false story a step further by stating that Chappelle Corby herself had bought the marijuana, something that even Macaulay had ventured to claim. The hunger to spin a sensation at the expense of truth could hardly be more starkly illustrated. Fairfax subsequently withdrew and changed the headline, but not before it had been copied across the internet. The headline in the age was perhaps even more disturbing. This tarnished the entire Corby family. At the very least, this provided evidence of how the newspaper itself viewed the message from Duff's handiwork. It significantly damaged the reputation of the Corby family and reduced public sympathy for the incarcerated and by now mentally ill Chappelle Corby. The story itself was full of all the lurid comments one might expect. Duff was apparently falling over himself with carefully selected subplots. For example, Chappelle's Bali-based sister has publicly admitted to making a frantic dash to Denpasar Airport with cash in hand as the nightmare was unfolding, but by the time she arrived, it was too late. Anyone who has actually seen that clip of Mercedes from the Gunja Queen film will immediately recognize how Duff has stretched this. She took the equivalent of $140 when she was called to the airport, imagining there was a micro dot amount somewhere in some mix-up scenario. When you got the phone call that night, yeah. what happened? I don't know what I thought. Even though I knew she probably never touched the stuff, maybe someone had left a little bit in her bag or someone had a little smoke. And I don't know what I was thinking. You know, I actually um, 
got a million rupee, <laughs> put it in my pocket, and off I went to the airport thinking I'm going to sort this out with my million rupee, <laughs> $140. And I don't know, I just didn't think it would be what it was. But in Eamon Duff's world, she was apparently going to pay a $140 bribe in respect of $50,000 worth of drugs. And naturally, there was no mention of the general Balinese gratuity culture. A semblance of sanity was again restored by the police who were clear about the nature of Duff's reporting, describing the Macaulay claims as laughable. They explained that they had known about Macaulay's claims for 12 months, had investigated them, and had found them to be false. They made a number of very direct formal statements to get the message across. For example, an investigation made by Queensland Police into statements made against Mick Corby found these statements to be unjustified. And, Queensland Police has no evidence to link Mick Corby with involvement in the drug trade. This could hardly be clearer. Informally, the police were equally damning of this disturbing fabrication and opportunism. David McHugh again sought to set the record straight, stating clearly that McCauley did not know Chappelle Corby and that his only contact with the Corby family was through himself as he had actually introduced him to the family in Bali. I met Malcolm in October 2004 on the plane coming from Australia to Bali. I did not know him before that trip and he did not know Chappelle Corby. I got to know the family through going to the court hearings. Malcolm one time came to the court hearings with me which I introduced Malcolm to the family. These and other inconvenient interventions which destroyed his story was simply overlooked or omitted by Duff. He continued to push the fabricated and wholly discredited allegations relentlessly, even though they had been so clearly dismissed. For example, in December 2008, a pop song was released in support of Chappelle Corby in New York. Duff simply used this as an opportunity to repeat his debunked story. This was discussed at the time as follows. So, fellow journalists, shall we perform an elementary subject interview as a class exercise and construct some sensible questions for Mr. Duff on his eloquent masterpiece? How about these, just for starters? Was that much-trumpeted exclusive interview with convicted criminal Macaulay paid for, Mr. Duff? If so, how much was he paid? Did you not check his credibility with the police, Mr. Duff? Why no quote from the police at all in your exclusive story, Mr. Duff? Wouldn't a quote from the police strengthen your story? Or is it that you believe that their comments would blow your story away as a blatant smear? Please allow a fellow journalist to assist. Did you see what he did there? He simply asked the police. That's what journalists do. They investigate the truth. Why didn't you contact the lead subject of this story, Tara Hack, for a comment? And you didn't because I checked. Was that because you were too focused upon the objective of re-delivering a smear? Did you obtain the Michael Corby police certificate, Mr. Duff? If not, why not? And if so, why didn't you mention it? Allow me to help you again. Here it is. Isn't the truth that the exclusive was wholly manufactured via the first drug runner who came along making such damaging claims? And that you avoided seeking credible substantiation like the play because you knew what the outcome would be? Further, that you now rerun this smear as legitimate even though you are well aware that it is bogus? This was a story about a song, a talented artist on the other side of the world, creating something extraordinary to support a suffering Australian. But he used it to reinforce a message that had already been wholly discredited and perversely 
to self-congratulate Sydney Morning Herald for the attending exclusive interview. Presenting claims by convicted criminal as though they had credibility, whilst ignoring the reference certificate issued by Queensland Police and the comments by operational detectives that the claims were laughable, appears to expose the standards to which Mr Duff works. It is also worthy of note that the Queensland Police Service have recorded a formal statutory declaration stating that there is no direct evidence or even indirect evidence to link Chappelle Corby with drugs. Subsequently, they also confirmed that, despite Duff's activities, there remained no evidence to link Mr Corby with the drug trade. It should also be noted that, whilst Duff was producing this material, he was not reporting any of the emerging evidence which was central to the case. In September 2011, ministerial correspondence was published proving that Chappelle Corby's boogie board bag was the only one not scanned at Sydney Airport. Ministers and the AFP had withheld this vital primary evidence. Yet despite its huge significance for the case, Duff has failed to mention it in any report. In October 2011, it emerged that Chappelle Corby's bags were five kilograms overweight on the Qantas system, yet she had checked them in underweight. Again, this was vital evidence withheld from Chappelle Corby and the Bali court. Again, despite its obvious significance, Duff has failed to report it at all. Over the subsequent 18 months, an entire series of similar evidence came to light. None of it has been reported either by Duff, Fairfax Media or the media in general. It has been replaced by the fabrications and smears documented within this film. <laughs>